We appreciate you being with us, Frank. Uh, first question is an important one. Can you just set the record straight for everybody in here, just how many fumbles there were in that Super Bowl game? <laughs> Th thanks for asking. Three fumbles and two interceptions. Do you want to elaborate lost, on any of those 50, fumbles? We lost 52 to 17. AFC Yeah. Well, uh, on a, a more serious note, um, what's your favorite thing about coaching? And can you speak to the spiritual life as is appropriate amongst the players and uh, coaching staff of the Colts? Yeah, my favorite thing about coaching is, based on what I just said, this is not going to come as a surprise, but trying to bring out the best in other people. I mean, and doing it in football, you know? I mean, as I don't look at, you know, there was a time, I think, in a place where I thought, oh, football is just a game. It's not just a game. I mean, it's, all of life is important. Every aspect, like I said, to the glory of God, it's all important. So I don't look at sports as just an afterthought. It's, part, it's an important part of our culture. So for me, um, to like, and because I was a former quarterback and I have a history as a quarterback coach, like I really love working with the whole team, but I like really especially working with quarterbacks, especially when they're really good, like Peyton Manning and Andrew Luck, you know, because then, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, because they're already pretty good. But how do you take somebody who's already great and still make them even better? And, um, and then the second part, because it's a good question, is to make them better, but then also, you know the season is a long season. It, it's not all going to be like this. And it's really going through, going through some of the struggles together and being able to go, let's go. Let's go and helping people through the struggles um, and, and, the, and the personal relationships that develop are really important. Amen. What counsel would you give to an athlete, whether a football player or any other player, who wants to do the best they can, compete to the glory of God without idolizing sports? Mm. <clears throat> Great question. Um, I, I think we got to keep short accounts. It's a slippery slope. Um, it's a slippery slope because, right, if we have too, too high of a view, right, if we have too high of a view of sports, sports can become an idol. Sports was an idol in my life. If I were to give you my full testimony, it would be the 15-second the version is football was an idol. It was taken away in a flash through an injury. I thought it was over. I was never going to get my chance. And it all got put in perspective because what I thought was going to be my entire life was taken away, and somehow the Lord used it to make... No, get your priorities straight. That right now, that's an idol in your life. So, um, I would say two things. You know, run away from the idol, but also more for me, it's also continuing to run towards something. Don't just run away from. Run towards Christ. You know. So that's why for me, the daily devotions that we do, like our team. You know, not everybody on the team does it, but the U version Bible app. Does anybody use the U version app Bible app? Well, like we got a lot of guys in our team that do that, and we're going through a read through the Bible in the year together. And there's like 20 some guys on it, you know, and coaches, players and coaches, and we read through, and guys might write something. And so I think by being in the Word daily, it reminds me to run toward fix our Hebrews 12:2, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The best way to not make something an idol is to worship the one true and living God. Amen. And a similar question: as a previous seminary president, what counsel would you give to a seminary student? some of whom are in this audience, and how to keep the main thing the main thing in the midst of their studies. I really have an appreciation for seminary students because, you know, having been through it, my, my wife and I both been through it, um, you know, and so my, I guess what counsel I would have to a seminary student would be, um, it's just, it's about the people in the process. It's, a, it's about people. And don't fall into the trap. I mean, I know this doesn't happen, but it does happen. You know, you learn a lot. I mean, I went to seminary. I had some professors, you know, I had some professors like Nicholas who just blew my mind with some things of God that really, truly, spiritually moved me in ways and that I just never wanted to get to the point where it was just an intellectual exercise, right? It was all about, right, intimacy, right? So here's so really, 
what I would say to a seminary student, to a football player, to a mom, a dad. It's all about intimacy, right? Knowing Jesus, right? Paul says, I consider everything a loss, everything a loss. Knowledge puffs up, that's right, right? In context, that's what Paul's talking about. He knows it all. He's the best seminary student that ever lived. And he says, ah, that's loss compared to what? The surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So you've got a lot of diverse players from all different backgrounds. And what are some of the ways that you lead them to a common unified goal to work together to strive for success? Um, that's one of the things I love about sports is that I think sports leads, we certainly have a lot of flaws, but we lead the way in really respecting and working together around a common mission. But it really is deeper than just a common mission. It's, it, it comes in believing in the person and seeing the good in people. And, you know, when you're trying to, like last year we used this analogy about climb, as a team, about climbing Mount Everest. You know that thing's impossible to climb. You know you can't climb that on your own. You gotta believe the best. I gotta believe that the guy in front of me who's holding the rope has got my back. And you got, and so, you know, when we get in a situation, it, it's not just about accepting everybody and acknowledging, you know, but it's about believing in people, believing in the best in people of, of all socioeconomic diversity, you know, believe in people. Even when you get hurt, still keep believing. Right? Be smart. We got to be smart. I get that. I mean, we got to, I get that. But don't ever lose that. Don't ever lose that, that hope in other people that, that see the positive. Still be, you know, wise as, you know, wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove, but still believe in people. A lot of people are really interested to know if you let your daughter keep the Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. We did let her keep the Barbie, yeah. <laughs> because she conquered that thing. <laughs> so in, in the vein of uh, family, you've obviously got a number of work responsibilities. Uh, you're a public figure. What are some of the ways that you guard time with family in the midst of being faithful in your role as head coach of the Colts? It's hard, I mean, you know, everybody knows that the life of an NFL coach is, you know, leave, the, leave the house somewhere 5 or 5.30, get home at 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And um, on a, a lot of days, that's during the season. That's not, the off season is more normal. Well, it's a little bit normal. My wife would tell you it's not that normal. <laughs> but, um, and I'm not saying this for, but you have to make some, I'm not saying this for, uh, you know, it's going to sound stupid, but I'm not saying this for a pat on the back, but you still have to make sacrifices. What we did, what Linda and I did was, you know, I played, for a few years. And when I got done playing, I had an opportunity to go into coaching right away. Our daughters at the time, when I retired from playing, were eight, six, and two. And so I had job offers to go coach in the NFL when they were that age. And now, and, and, and at the time, I, I turned those offers down and I went into full-time ministry for about six or seven years so that I could be at home, go to my daughter's events, take them to school, change diapers, and gave up you could say big contract, big coaching contracts, because I really wanted to be there to pour into our children's life. That's the decision that Linda and I made together. She was just graduated seminary, and we thought maybe God was calling us to be in full-time ministry the rest of our lives. So we went into full-time ministry together and, you know, and did what that entailed and the things that the Lord called us to do. But then I found like sometimes, and I think this is good counsel for me and for hopefully somebody here, there's seasons of life. And you know, after a season of life and our girls got a little bit older, I think the Lord kind of released me. Okay, you know, your children are older now, spent six years pouring in, you know, now go ahead and I'm calling you to go, go, be, this, go be a coach and go do that to the glory of God. Thank you, Lord. How do you, <laughs> amen. How do you compete to the glory of God and be the best you can in your specific field without bringing glory to yourself? And how would you speak to that? Well, according to the Bible, we never really do that. We never really, do, I, I, I think, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but here's my understanding that, right, that our motives are always gonna be a little bit tainted, 
I, I, I do believe that because of sin, sin is so strong and it's so rampant and it's so vile, it's so vile that even our best, you know, sometimes there's going to be hidden motivations. But don't let that discourage you, right, from doing the right thing. Because God says, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Just because Satan's alive, just because sin is real in our life, doesn't mean that we can't do good to the glory of God, even though there might be, you know, I think that's part of the process is, you know, it's like I've used the analogy, Linda and I have said this, you know, sometimes we're driving down the highway, and you ever drive down the highway where a skunk was just run over, right? That skunk is dead, right? The skunk is dead, but it's how many hours later and it still smells. The Bible says we were crucified with, the old self was crucified with Christ. And yet I live, not, but yet not he that lives, you know, I mean, he lives in and through us. But guess what? We're still going to smell the stinky old nature. The skunk that was killed was a wretched man, right? What did Paul say in Romans 7? Who can save me from this body of death? Oh, but thanks be to God, the gospel can save me from this body of death. And he does, it's crucified with Christ. But guess what? The stench remains. And I feel like, and I, they're, they're, they used to say that in ancient Near Eastern times, that one of the penalties for committing uh, murder, and I may not have this exactly right, but I think this is pretty close. So forgive me if it's not exactly right, but you're gonna get the idea is that it, for certain crimes, really heinous crimes, you had to carry around a dead animal carcass, okay, to be reminded of your crime. And, and, and you had to walk through the town and do, and this thing had to go with you everywhere you go. And so sometimes I've, I, I envision myself, you know, my old nature, my sinful nature is it's this dead carcass that has already been crucified with Christ. It's dead. There's no chance. The Bible says it's dead. Christ defeated it. He's not going to win. There's no chance Satan is going to come back and snatch salvation. No, no, it's dead. Christ ensured that, but it's coming around with me. It won't leave me, right? It's not going to leave me while, while I'm walking on this earth until what, right? We talked about Genesis 1 and 2 being a vision of like before sin entered the world. Well, guess what? This is how amazing the Bible is. Revelation 21 and 22 is the bookend. It's the other two chapters at the end of the Bible. And that's a story. Just read Revelation 21 tonight, the, down from heaven came a new heaven and a new earth, and God was there, and he was with his people, and guess what it was like? It was like it was Genesis 1 and 2, right? Sin was no more. Death had been put away, and so while we walk through this earth, we have this dead carcass. It's our sin nature. It's going to stink. It's going to smell, and that's why sometimes I envision I go through rocky times in my life, and, I, and I've learned to respect those rocky times and those hardships because it's like pulling a dead carcass along rocky terrain and it's tearing off some of that old flesh and it's getting, it's getting rid of some. And so somehow I'm being conformed into the image of Christ through these hardships and it's getting rid of some of that old stinky nature as I think sometimes. So it's always going to be there, but keep pressing on, right? That's what Paul says in Romans 3, I mean, Philippians 3, 14, but I press on to the goal to take hold. Hey, forget what is behind, press on. How is a coach like a pastor, and what opportunities have you had to shepherd some of your players? Uh, you know, I mean, here's the, way that, here's the way that Linda and I approach that in our station in life. Um, the Bible, I, I think there's a time to be very bold, and, and, but uh, 1 Peter 3.15 says, you know, always be prepared to tell others the hope that you have right, for the reason that the hope you have within. Always be prepared to tell others the hope you have. But does anybody know what the last part of that passage says? Excuse me? With gentleness and when they ask. And when they ask. Now, I'm not saying that I never stand up on the rooftop and shout out the name of Jesus and the gospel. I, I do that. I mean, do events. I do evangelistic events. But in my workplace, I don't beat people over, you know, I don't beat people over the head with the Bible. I, I, I'm a football coach. I'm not their pastor. I'm a football coach. So I go in there and I coach football to the best of my ability, to the glory of God. And, you know, what happens is you're working hard with these guys. You get to know each other. You know, if I'm going to get to know you, I'm going to get to, we're not just talking about football. 
Uh, you know, I'm going to talk about your kids. You're going to ask about my kids. We're going to talk about life. And then at some point, we're going to go through hardship together. And some of that stuff just comes out. So I try not to force it, but I always want to be ready. I always want to be ready. And then do it with gentleness. So one perceptive question asks, in light of uh, what you've just presented on Created to Compete, do you think there's reason to believe that there will be competition in heaven once the Great Commission has been completed? Touche. <laughs> yeah. Striving together. I, I, I don't know. I've never been asked that question. Um, my gut reaction, let's be as the Bereans, check it out, read the Bible, let's just figure it out. But um, yeah, here's why I would say that. In fact, I, I, I forgot that it's been a while since I've looked at those notes. But here's why competition is possible without, it's, we've already proven that competition was in the world without sin. Right? In Genesis 1 and 2, there was no, sin was not in the world. And there was competition. We were given the command, right? And in heaven, we're all still going to have jobs, right? I remember when I learned this in seminary. You know, this blew my mind. Because I don't know, somehow I had this vision of heaven like we're all going to float around and have wings and, you know, float, you know, but heaven's, right? Revelation 21 says what? No, there's a new earth. It's, it's the Garden of Eden. Uh, it's like uh, the Garden of Eden is like an apple tree that is just out of the ground, right? It's only grown up to here. It's an apple tree. But fully mature and fully grown, that apple tree is much bigger. The Garden of Eden was a small apple tree, right, without sin. The, the, the kingdom, you know, the new heavens and new earth is, and, and Christ's resurrection, his physical resurrection from the dead, right, is the very grounds on which the Bible tells us because Christ was physically resurrected, the, guess what that means? The earth is going to be resurrected. That's what Revelation 21 says. The earth is resurrected to a new heavens and a new earth where we're living in new bodies. We get new bodies too. They don't have wings, I don't think, you know, and we're, it's like we're on a new earth and we have jobs and we're doing them to the glory of God. As far as I know, that's the answer. Uh, Someone named Tom Brady asked the question, how does a biblical view of competition impact one's perspective of retirement? <laughs> Great question. Great question given in a really interesting way. It says there is no retirement. We never retire, right? There are no spectators. We may retire from our vocational jobs, but you know, if you're in here and you've retired from your work, you're still working for the glory of God. It, winning can take new faces. Allow yourself the grace to understand you're in a different phase of life. But just also understand that the wisdom and power that God has built into your life after all these years can, can really be poured out into in a lot of significant ways. Well, final question before we pray. At the end of your life, after you've accomplished everything that God has given you favor to accomplish, how do you want to be remembered? What do you want your legacy to be, Coach Frank? Acts 20, 24, which, which says where Paul says, you know, that he says, I finished, hey, this is my goal in life, that I would finish the task of what God has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of grace. And that's what Paul said, that's what Luke says about what he's quoting Paul, that he would finish the task, uh, the task of testifying to the gospel of grace. And I, I hope God does that through me as a football coach, you know, by the way I coach, by being good at my job, by treating people the right way, by when we win, do it with grace, when we lose, do it with grace, and be an encouragement to people, right? And don't be a judger, you know, don't be a judger, but also don't be afraid, be courageous, stand for something. You know, don't fall, don't fall in a trap, okay, I'm not gonna be a judger, so I'm never gonna challenge anybody. We can challenge somebody without judging them and thinking we're better than them. Linda and I do that all the time. <laughs> I mean, that's, part, that's how you grow. That's, I've, been in, I've been in some really heated discussions and when I was a player, there, I had a teammate who I'm still good friends with to this day. He believed something completely different. This guy was incredibly smart. This guy was more book smart than I was. He'd come at me with things. He'd have questions for me. He'd poke holes in 
my quote unquote faith in theology that I didn't have answers for. I'd get mad and I'd go back and I'd read and study. I'd try to find answers. I'd, somebody help me figure this. I don't know. I don't, you know, so uh, that's part of the fun of it. And let me just say, I really appreciate you guys hanging in there. And this, this is a lot of fun. This is real practical stuff now. I've often said, I'm not sure there's a biblical topic that would be, have more practical application than to how we think about competition, okay? Because it really is literally, it's so pervasive in our culture, and that's not a bad thing. We were created to have ambition, a holy ambition, you know, but we just have to understand that we're gonna get that taker mentality that Nicholas was talking about. We're gonna get that taker, and we gotta just, when we get that, we just gotta put that aside. And then the last thing, as just allow me to say, I know Nicholas said this at the beginning, I know nobody here wants to take a picture or say hello to me afterwards. I don't think anybody does, but um, I, I just would appreciate, uh, I'd like to say hello and take a few pictures on the way out, but it has been long, so I, I appreciate um, you being able to be here, and I really do wish I could stay and talk to people for the next hour or so, but um, tomorrow's another early morning. It's been a long day today, so I'm just humbly and graciously asking that um, you would allow my wife and I to just slowly make our way out. We would appreciate that. Let's thank God for Frank coming here. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, let's bow together in prayer. Father, you've cr created us to compete, and you've created us to fulfill this creation mandate of Genesis 126 and 128 to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to exercise dominion. And Father, I pray that you would help everyone in Christ to do that here well. But I also pray that you would help us in light of that to exercise dominion in our disciple-making activities that we would not only obey the creation mandate, but the great commission of our Lord, who tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I, Jesus, have commanded you. And Father, we pray for our brother Frank. We're grateful that he's here with us tonight. And Father, we pray that you would give him favor. Lord, we pray that you'd give him favor with his players, with his coaches, with those who he has spheres of influence with. Lord, I pray that you would use this man as an instrument to bring many people closer to Jesus, whether he wins football games or loses football games. I pray that you would use this man for your glory. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thanks for coming tonight. You're dismissed.